get in. If we can, let's give the Lord a hand clap for the That was wonderful. Thank you all for leading us in worship. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is uh, Sandy Brown. I'm a pastor. Um, I promise I'm not a member of the youth group at the Baptist <laughs> I'm a pastor of the church across the street. And uh, I am grateful and honored to uh, be bringing the word this evening. If you have a copy of God's word, our text for this evening is Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. We, we find ourselves in the Thanksgiving season, and there's a lot that goes with being in the Thanksgiving season. There's the mad dash to prepare food, to get ready for company, and you might find yourself in the midst of all this busyness. Perhaps you've already been through a Thanksgiving, and you have more Thanksgivings to go through as the week progresses. You might find yourself asking, what's the point of all this? You know, why are we going through so much trouble uh, in order to carry this out? It seems more certain than it's worth, especially when crabby relatives show up. They come, they eat, and then they can't clean up. <laughs> they say they have a long drive ahead of them before the dishes start getting done. But the point is, hopefully, the memories that are formed, the love that is shared, and it is a dedicated time of gratefulness that can be had. It may seem pointless, but there's in fact great meaning behind it. And often faith might be the same way. Faith might seem pointless, but there is in fact great meaning behind it. But I hope to focus this evening on the fact that faith would be pointless if God did not act first. If God did not move first. For revelation and for redemption. So with that in mind, let's look now at Titus chapter 2. And again in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession zealous for good deeds. May the Lord add to the reading of his word. You may ask yourself, you know, why do we come to a text like this? And if someone asks me, Brother Sam, what is Christianity? If you had to give a summary statement of what Christianity is, I would point them towards this passage. There's a lot packed into these verses. And more so, Paul seems to focus here on how God acted, how God acts and how God will act. In fact, that seems to be the structure of these verses. In verse 11, he says that God has appeared. Verse 12, he talks about the present age. Verse 13, he talks about the appearing of the glory to come. He emphasizes God's movement. And none of this movement would be possible, our faith itself, unless God moved first. And I hope this evening to distinguish between God's moving first in Revelation and God moving first in redemption. Again, in verse 11, he starts out by saying that God has appeared. What God did in the past, and what was that thing that God did in the past but to bring salvation. This idea of appearing that we see here in verse 11 it comes from the Greek verb Epiphano, from which we get our own English word, epiphany. All right, that's a good vocabulary for, for the students. That when God appeared, there was an epiphany of some sense. That salvation was now on the scene. Now, the fact that God moves first is, is a little ironic. Because God doesn't have to move first. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need to talk to us. In fact, He didn't need to create us. In philosophical terms, God is what we call necessary. That God has to exist. That He's the only thing that has a right to exist. He has everything that He needs within Himself. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it is we who are the other side of necessary, which is contingent. That we depend on Him. In fact, we depend on a lot of things. Be it food, water, shelter, family, place to worship. We find ourselves at God's need, not that God needs us. 
But why does he create us in the first place? Why does he talk to us? Why does he save us? He doesn't create us. He didn't have to create us, but he does. Why? Because he wanted to. He didn't have to communicate with us. But why does he in the first place? Because he wanted to. He spoke to Abraham. He gave the law to Moses. He spoke through the prophets. He sent Jesus. He told us how to live the Christian life through Jesus' teachings, through the inspiration of the apostles, through how the scriptures were gathered in the church. In fact, he speaks even to all of humanity in all places and all times through creation itself. That's Paul's argument in Romans chapter 1, that none are without excuse. That creation itself points to God in his character. Moreover, God didn't have to say what he does. Why? Because he wanted to. And it's even more surprising that God saves creation even after creation rejects him time and time and time again. Why does he do all of these things? Because God wants to. And it shows us a few things about God's character. God takes the first step. And he takes the first step in moving towards humanity because he wants to. Now if God does all of this can we discern anything about God's character? And perhaps a better question to ask is what is a central aspect of God's character that wraps up all of these other things? Now, then to think for a moment. If I asked you to describe God is something, what would you put in that blank? Well, scripture tells us in 1 John 1, 5 that God is light. But God existed long before light ever existed. He was the one that created light and brought it into being. John later on, in 1 John 4, 8, says that God is love. But what does he mean by that word, love? In fact, love can have multiple meanings. Jesus himself says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus, in this statement, focuses on truth and life. What is there to say about God's other attributes? Or if we focus on God's other attributes, what about of his holiness? Leviticus 11.44, he tells the Israelites to be holy because he is holy. Or later on in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, where God gives this wonderful statement of his own character to Moses as he passed before Moses. He says that he's merciful, compassionate, that he has loving kindness. Or even in Exodus chapter 3, where God first reveals his covenant name to the Israelites and he tells Moses, I am that I am, or that I exist because I have to exist, or that I'm the one that exists perfectly. You see, scattered throughout all of Scripture, we have all of these different characteristics of God's nature. And if we focus on one, we jeopardize putting the others to neglect. Is there any one term that can wrap up what God is? And I want to offer you something this evening. You may do with it as you will. But a professor told me one time that if we had to describe God in one word, and as futile as that is because of God's infinite nature, but if we had to describe one thing that God is above all the others, I would say that God is self-giving. That it is God's nature to give himself away. And isn't that what we see in how God moves and how God acts throughout history? That God is the one who moves first and that God does so out of desire that he wants to give of himself to us. He wants to live with his creatures in holy union. Why does God give himself away? Again, as we've said this evening and as we'll say a few more times, it's because he wants to. And this reminds us of his grace and of his love towards us. Furthermore, it reminds us of our place in relationship to the Lord. That God is greater than us, infinitely greater than us. That we wouldn't exist unless God created us. More so, we wouldn't exist unless God sustains us. Right? We like to praise God as creator, but do we praise God as sustainer of his people? Because as Paul says when he uh, is speaking to the Areopagites in Athens, he describes God as the one in whom we live and move and have our very being. That everything that is us is 
who rested in the Lord. We wouldn't have known God unless He communicated with us. We wouldn't have been saved if He didn't redeem us. And I say all of this to point out the fact that we often get tunnel vision with our own existence. We, we like to get wrapped up in our own little bubbles. Right? And this week is a perfect example of that. How many of us have our own plans and our own itineraries and we have this group of people showing up at this time and we have to get this done by that time and we just get stuck in our own lane per se and blind to the rest of the world around us and blind to the fact even in our day to day existence that everything we have is from the Lord now just because God gives himself away does not mean that God is a doormat that we can walk over or that God is in some way subservient to us Hopefully the fact that God gives himself away should inspire humility within our own being. And this was Peter's fault in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus takes his disciples to the base of Mount Hermon, there by Caesarea Philippi, he sits them down around the campfire and he says, Who do men say that I am? And they throw around a lot of ideas. You're Elijah. You're one of the prophets. You're John the Baptist. Come back after he got his head locked off. And then he looks at Peter, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus praises him. He says, you, you're right. It didn't come from you. This was given to you by the Father. Yes, Peter, you are right. But what happens immediately after this episode? Verse 21 of chapter 16, Jesus tells them what it means to be the Christ. It says from that time on, he began to show them that he must go to Jerusalem and be handed over and be beaten and be betrayed and be hung up on a cross and die and on the third day rise again. And what is Peter's response to that? God forbid it, Jesus. Starts to rebuke him right there in front of all the disciples. And we all know Jesus' words to Peter. He throws it right back in his face and he says, get behind me, Satan. And I've always been confused and, and perhaps in awe of Jesus' next statement, verse 24. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his place. There's an interesting little fact that was shown to me years ago that brought new light to this passage. When Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, get behind me, is the same phrase that he uses in verse 24 when he says, anyone who wishes to come after me. To get behind me is the same to come after Jesus. When we think of it as Jesus' rebuke of Peter, that he's putting Peter in his right place, and in many ways he is, but he's just reminding Peter of what it means to be a disciple. That it's not Peter that gets to decide what it means to be Christ's Messiah, but it is in fact Jesus' own definition. And he was inviting Peter to yield to that reality. God moves first. And because God moves first and he gives himself away, we should come to him in humility and greatness of that truth. God moves first because he wants to and God moves first for the fact of salvation. As we've already pointed out in verse 11, when Paul writes, for the grace of God has appeared, he modifies that with the participle, bringing salvation to all men. And the fact that God gives himself away is, most, is seen most clearly in the fact that he brings salvation to all people. And that all people have the chance to be saved. God's self-givenness is seen most clearly in his redemption. We, we've talked about how he didn't have to create or how he didn't have to communicate. How much more did he not have to save? Especially after creation's willful rebellion. And God just didn't give himself away in salvation. God took it a step further. As Paul also writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11, he describes Christ emptying himself. That he didn't regard to be equal with God, a thing to be grasped, but he came and he took the likeness of a servant. Now he took on flesh. You know, next Sunday is December, right? Some of y'all probably already got Christmas. 
You know, it, we are tempted to rush past Thanksgiving and go into the Christmas season. But with that idea of Christmas and with the season of Advent coming upon us, we are again reminded of Christ's first coming, of the incarnation of God, God taking on human flesh. That Jesus left heaven, that he robed himself in humanity, and he died on our behalf. And he didn't just die, and praise God that the story doesn't end there, but he, that he rose, that he ascended, and that he sent the Spirit and gave us a full-orbed vision of salvation. God came in the person of Jesus to reconcile us to himself. And God comes in the Spirit into your life to make that reconciliation a possibility as a relationship. God moves first in revelation, but God also moves first in redemption. And it is just beautiful how Paul points this passage that every time God moves, God moves with a purpose. And in verse 11, God appeared first to bring salvation. And he clarifies that a little bit more for us in of what salvation means in verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Right? Paul describes salvation as redemption and as purification. Now, redemption, we, we like to think of it as, as one of those fancy church words. Right? We all have our fancy church words we like to throw in. Redemption just means to buy back something. You ever thought about that? You redeem a gift coupon or a gift card or something like that? To buy something back. And what was Jesus' work of salvation buying us back from? And I love the fact that Paul points out in verse 14 that it is from every lawless deed. There's ways about us. There's experiences that we have. There are things that we do a bit in our nature that keeps us from experiencing life with God. And you, you want to call that lawless deeds, then sure, go ahead. But there's no denying the fact that we as humans like lawlessness in some respect. I'm, I'm a teacher. I, I, I deal with plenty of lawless students. <laughs> week in and week out. And sometimes they just, they, they just want to push your buttons that day. Sometimes they just want to push your buttons. That there's, there's something in us that makes us more prone to sin than more prone to live life with God. What we often describe as original sin. And original sin has traditionally been understood as Adam's act of disobeying God in Genesis 3. And the guilt of Adam's disobedience being passed on to us down through the family line. It means this, that, that Adam is guilty of Adam's sin and all of Adam's children are guilty of Adam's sin. I want to offer you a, a different perspective on that this evening. If it's all right, I'm going to quote John Wesley here. You, you, you can quote Spurgeon next year. <laughs> <laughs> but Wesley had this idea of only Adam being guilty of Adam's sin and you being guilty of your sin. Right? And it fits with the biblical concept in the Old Testament that the children are not supposed to be held responsible for the sins of the parents. But there is this issue of inheritance. What do you inherit from Granddaddy Adam? Well, the only thing that Granddaddy Adam had to give, death and corruption. When Adam disobeyed the Lord, he lost what he had. He had a life with God, in holy union with God. He had the Spirit of God within him. And he loses this life with God in his sin. And in losing life with God, he takes up death and corruption. And he could, pass, he could have passed on life to his children if he had obeyed the Lord. But now the only thing that he passes on to his children is death. And this is both physical and spiritual death. That you don't have the life of God within you. That you're not just made a Christian. That you're just not made someone filled with the Holy Spirit. 
He lost the lot. He lost the life of God within him, and so have we. And because of that, we have no reason to be holy. Right? That it, it perfectly explains every all the evil and the wickedness that we see going on in the world around us. There's no reason to be holy if you don't have the life of God within you. And more so, it may be described as this: that you are born into a damaged world with damaged people. And so, what is there to do but to be damaged yourself? But, and here, here comes Paul again. As he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ is a new Adam. What might we say? The last Adam. That Christ, in his redemption of humanity, makes a new human race possible. And that when you're born again, you enter into this new life as a new person, as part of a new species. And that's a revolutionary understanding of the gospel. Right? We, we, we talk of the new heavens. We talk of the new earth. We, we sing songs like when we all get to heaven and what a day that will be. And I'll fly. Y'all ever seen that book here? Those are good songs because they give us hope about what's to come. But there's a reality that you can experience in Christ right now. That it's not just new creation far off, but there's a new human race right here, right now, that you are invited to be a part of. Homo Deus. You want to describe it that way. There's a whole new type of human. Because when Adam brought death and passed on death, it was Christ who brought life and offers life and passes on life to those who believe. In him. These lawless deeds, this result of Adam's sin, the corruption that we see in the world, the bent within us towards sinning, is because of your inheritance from Granddaddy. But through Christ and through the redemption that he offers, you can be freed from that into this new humanity. Now, West, I promise this is the last question before. <laughs> Wesley had this idea of the ordo salutis, or the way of salvation. And he described salvation in these terms because for him, salvation was not just a moment in time. When you said a prayer and you were brought into the Lord's kingdom, that, that's not where salvation ends. If anything, that's where salvation begins. And he described salvation as this lifelong, more eternal process. Of, of being justified and of having sanctification along the way and of one day being glorified into the new creation. And that salvation was a relationship with God. And I think we can all say amen to that. Amen. That salvation is a relationship with our God. But this starting point, this entrance into this new life, this entrance into this new humanity is what we call justification. Or being made right before the Lord. Wesley called it the new birth. Or what we know today as being born again. Or as Christ told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. To be born again is to be, be born from above. To be born into this new humanity. When Christ, the last Adam, breaks the power of lawless deeds over your life. He gives you what you should have gotten from Adam. The life of God within you. And that means an astounding truth. That you don't have to be subject to those lawless deeds anymore. That Christ, we, we, there's a song, Amazing Grace, that He breaks our chains. He's a chain breaker. He's a way maker. I don't, I'm probably getting my songs confused. But that those are beautiful scriptures for what Christ does. That he frees us from the power of sin. And he frees us from the power of sin to live life with God. And Paul has an amazing scope in mind here in verse 14. Where he says he redeems us from every lawless deed. That there's no sin too big. That there's no sin too wicked. That there's no corner of your life so dark and decrepit that the light of Jesus can't come to shine in and cleanse you from that. That Christ brings freedom. That He can, that He will break whatever lawless deeds power 
over. And he can offer you something much better than those lawless thieves and the captivity that is involved with those thieves. He can offer you the life of a new person, birthed into this new people of God, those who experience life with God. Amen and amen. Please join me with prayer, and then I'll invite you to the Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Father, too often we neglect the things in our lives that we should be thankful to you for. And I pray this evening that we have been reminded that everything that we have comes from you, even our relationship with you, Lord. That that is a reality that is made possible because of you. That you moved first to make yourself known, and that you moved first to redeem us from our sin and the death that pain strangles us so tightly. And so, Lord, I pray this evening that that reality of the new life that you offer so freely and so graciously, that it would be a reality in the lives of those here. And that those who have experienced it, Lord, that you would draw them deeper into that life of you. And those who have not, would you send your grace before them to draw them and move them unto yourself and unto your glorious name. We thank you for this evening. Thank you for the chance to come and to fellowship together. Thank you for this reminder that we are your people, that we are part of this new humanity, and that we worship Christ as the last step. We praise you, and we pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So thank you.